Next on KCTS 9 Connects. You know, we are again, in a sense, reinventing the wheel of, uh, of the publication of news. It's been a year since the Seattle PI became the PI.com. So has the online-only paper found a new model of journalism? A closer look next. Local production and broadcast of KCTS 9 Connects with Enrique Cerna is made possible in part by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by KCTS 9 members. Become a member today by going to kcts9.org. Thank you. Welcome to KCTS 9 Connects, taking you beyond the headlines of Northwest news, issues, and politics. Coming up, Seattle budget trouble. I'll be talking with Seattle City Council member and budget chair Gene Godden. But first, the future of local news. One year ago, the Seattle PI stopped printing newspapers and became an online-only publication. Was it the end of a local paper or the beginning of a new kind of journalism? Senior producer Ethan Morris takes a look. 146 years of history is closing here. It was dubbed a rally, but a gathering outside the offices of the Seattle Post Intelligencer and took on the feeling of a wake as the newspaper announced it will stop printing after today. It was the news story that stunned the news itself. After nearly 150 years, the Seattle PI, as Seattle knew it, was coming to an end. The industry is closely watching the Post Intelligencer's online-only switch. The paper is the largest one to make the move so far, and media watchers are eager to see if the company can find a way to be successful. But one year later, the people at the PI.com, at least those still working there, are celebrating a year of success as the latest oxymoron, an online paper. You know, we are again, in a sense, reinventing the wheel of, uh, of the publication of news. Man is Joel Connolly at SeattlePI.com. A quick... Venerated columnist Joel Connolly is one of the staffers kept on at the new PI.com. Connolly admits it's been a transition going from one publication a day to a round-the-clock news operation. We are in a 24-7 news cycle. People want to know now. The organization has in a way been defined as we've gone along. Uh, there's been more talk about finding hot new models than you have in actor Leonardo DiCaprio's entourage. So have they found the hot new model? The move to online only definitely reflects the newest trend among news readers. According to a State of the News Media report by the Pew Project for Excellence in Journalism, only cable and online news sources saw growth in 2009. Network news, local TV, magazines, and traditional newspapers all saw declines. The study found online news visitors increased by nearly 10 percent. It's great that they've made it this far. Um, it's, it seems to me, from what I hear and what I see, that the PI.com is still seen as a relatively vibrant source of information and news in the Seattle area. Hansen Hussain is the director of the Master of Communication in Digital Media program at the University of Washington. While he believes digital platforms are the future of news, he wonders if something is getting lost in the digital switch. And the PI.com has a different news approach now, now that it's online. It seems, at least from my untrained eye, not to be as hard-hitting as it used to be. So just what is the PI.com formula? With a staff of about 20, they boast streamlined content with local reporters covering breaking news, politics, business, and crime. They've developed partnerships with other organizations to provide lifestyle coverage such as movie reviews and cooking. And now they rely heavily on community bloggers, more than 200 people writing about everything from neighborhood issues, sports, books, real estate, fashion, you name it. Many of the partners have been, of course, uh, blogs, neighborhood blogs. It's, it's a curious situation as we get into the global village. People are far more concerned now about their particular corner of the global village. And consequently, we've moved in that direction. But beyond the content, there is the bigger question of money, which is why, of course, the PI made the online switch to begin with. Have they really developed a new revenue model for journalism? According to the PI, the site is visited by more than 4 million people every month. 
But the same Pew Center study found that ad sales for newspapers, including online publications, fell 26% last year. And a whopping 79% of online news consumers say they rarely, if ever, have clicked on an online ad. The jury's still out on what the actual model is for journalism in the, in the 21st century, in this digital age. I mean, I, I still don't know whether the PI.com is, is the right model. I don't know how much they're being subsidized by a major company out east, which is Hearst. We are Hearst's baby, and the corporate parent is very much interested in our upbringing. So as traditional newspaper circulation continues to decline nationwide, many media eyes remain fixed on Seattle's online infant. To a certain extent, they do represent the future because they are very lean and mean infrastructure. Low costs, probably low revenue still, because online the revenues are much lower and they always will be. We're in a situation uh, where the business is evolving. And this is again, you know, we have struck out as pioneers in where we, where we end up and what type of civilization comes from it. You can't forecast the future. Next week on Connects, we continue our look at the changing landscape of local news. Our goal is nothing less than to cover the news in West Seattle, round the clock, 24-7. As new newspapers try to figure out a new formula, a wave of new media ventures is springing up in Seattle. But can they compete, and are they sustainable? That's next week on Connects. Coming up on Connects later, which members of our local congressional delegation are holding make or break votes in the health care debate? Still ahead, a report from the disaster zone in Haiti. Right now, Seattle's looming budget deficit. New estimates show the city's budget gap through 2011 has grown from 50 to 60 million dollars. Now the mayor says it could mean cuts in city services, higher fees and job cuts. And joining me now to talk more about all of this is Seattle City Council member Gene Godden, who is the chair of the Finance and Budget Committee for the city. And thanks for being here. Uh, can you give us an update? Uh, what is the latest on the budget situation with the city? Well, frankly, it's not very good. Uh, the mayor is quite correct in saying it's approximately 50 million that we think that we're short for this year. And of course, this comes on top of last year's budget cutbacks because we did cut back quite a bit for the, night, for the 2010 budget. What's the timeline to figure well, out what's going to happen and getting this done? Well, uh, we'll be getting a full report on where we are uh, after the first quarter of the year in April. Probably by mid-April, we'll know a whole lot more about our situation because we'll be able to have the first quarter tax returns. And we're going to be looking at it very carefully, and I'm sure that the mayor will be looking at it quite carefully as well. Obviously, we're in a recession that has a big impact on everybody's uh, pocketbook, statewide, nationally. For the city, when we talk about uh, revenues there, what, what's been hit? Well, sales tax, of course, is always uh, uh, pretty bad. Uh, I would say real estate excise tax. Uh, when uh, someone sells a building, uh, why we get uh, about a half of a percent of the sales price uh, in what is called REIT, R-E-E-T, which stands for real estate excise tax. So when everything slows down, it slows down it slows for the city, down. which then has the impact on the revenues and it, all those it things. It does indeed. So the, go uh, the governor, the mayor, has actually said that, uh, and actually she said this too, everything's on the table. And uh, he said, you know, the possibility of cuts, utility rate increases, staff layoffs, all of these things. What do you think of what he's said so far about all of these things? Well, I think he's quite correct in being concerned about it and being careful about it. I think that uh, there is a possibility that he will be doing some mid-course re reductions uh, probably by June, and I'm hoping that he will share those numbers with us. Uh, we appropriate the funds on the council, uh, but he can underspend. Right out. Off the bat, he had said that uh, there was going to be 200 top positions that he was looking to cut. He backed off that after getting kind of a firestorm. Um, when he made that announcement, what did you think? And uh, should he did he not consult with the council to tell you guys that that was what his thinking no, was? No, he did not consult with the council. A mistake? 
Uh, I think that might have been a bit of a mistake. Uh, certainly, we know that there will have to be some cutbacks. Um, that's 85% uh, of our uh, budget is in salaries, so we're fully aware of that. However, I think that just saying that you're going to take all the strategic advisors is probably not a good move. I think it's a bit better to look at it not by uh, position because a uh, strategic advisor is just uh, more or less of a pay grade. It's not a position. It's not a political appointee. Uh, it's uh, uh, somebody that has some expertise in a particular field and they're hired for that reason. So I think it's better to look at what kind of departmental or program cuts that you would be making rather than looking just at a position. And what about ready day fund? The rainy day fund, we do have one. Uh, we spent quite a bit of it uh, to balance our 2010 budget, and uh, it's unfortunate that we don't have it once you have spent it, while well, you don't have it, but we did put away a fair cushion. We put away 10 million point five, I think it is, uh, for a rainy day. We still have a rainy day fund. Will that be hit again this time well, around? I would presume that you might want to use some of it. We don't know. That would be the mayor's decision to uh, project that it would be used or not used. Uh, there is uh, some discussion about the fact that because we used it previously, that amount is not sustainable. It won't regrow itself. But we put that aside during good times. We didn't spend every penny that we had. Uh, we put it aside so that we would have something for rainy days. All right. Well, we're going to do a little bit more of an online conversation at kcts9.org slash connect so we talk a bit more about these budget issues and also some of your thoughts on our new mayor. Certainly. And, uh, thanks a lot, Jean Gunn, for joining happy, us. Happy. Happy right. to do that. It's been nine weeks since the catastrophic earthquake in Haiti, killing thousands and leaving tens of thousands homeless and hungry. Relief agencies have been working tireless to help. Stacy Howard, who is with the Salvation Army Northwest Division, is in Haiti right now and gives us this report from the disaster zone. My name is Stacy Howard, and I am the public information officer at the Haiti Command representing the Salvation Army World Service Office. There are NGOs here, we are one of them, which are non-government organizations, and there's about 800 to 1,000 NGOs here. So the Salvation Army is one, but we're a big one. And all the NGOs run what are called camps. We have a camp, and we have one of the larger ones, and it holds about 20,000 people squished into probably uh, a quarter of a mile in each direction. It's, it's very, very dense. There's no privacy. And, and when I say tents, these are not Coleman tents. These are sticks with tarp over them or any plastic that anybody can get a, a hold on. It's, and it's people of all ages, you know, and it, it's, it's sad. It's really, really hard to walk through there. Every Monday and Tuesday, we have food distribution. So we get shipments in over the weekend from the U.S. From all the money that people have donated, that's what it's going to. It's going to Numana and everything from Numana, which is kind of dry vegetables and rice and beans, uh, to MREs, which a lot of people know are, are what people in the military eat, uh, to buckets and cooking oil and kind of whatever, whatever the U.S. is sending us, we will take and we will distribute. And so, like I said, we do, that, we do that every Monday and Tuesday, and thousands of people line up. So that entire camp of 20,000 people, they're in line. One person from each family gets in line, and in about three hours, we distribute enough food to that entire camp. If anybody back in the States is wondering, you know, where's my money going? It's, it's getting here. It's getting here through food and buckets and eyeglasses and baby bottles and things like that. Every other building, I would say, is destroyed. I mean, you take two buildings, one of them's gone. There's rebar everywhere, and it, it just looks like thousands of pieces if you drop a ceramic cup and it just bursts into pieces. That's what all these buildings look like. It's not the roof got blown off in a tornado 
or some pieces of debris fell. What it reminds me of, big pancakes. There are four or five story buildings and when the quake hit, they just dropped on top of each other. You know, the kids are what keeps me going every day. And they just still have so much hope. They chase me through the camp. You know, they love Americans. They love light skin. They love the U.S. military. And they love having their photos taken. As you can see in those, they're, you know, they're, they're hams. And, you know, they'll take a balloon and kick it around as a soccer ball. And all these kids in these pictures you see, these are our students. We have a couple hundred kids in our school. Our classes have resumed. In, in one picture, you can see a teacher showing her class a book. And I walked by when I took that picture, and she would point to an animal. And in French, they'd all make the noises and say what the animal was. And those little girls sit with their arms around each other. The U.S. military has had a really close relationship with all the NGOs. I mean, we rely on them for security. This is not a safe place to be. So when we do our distributions each week, we basically go out to the airport, we load up our trucks, and then we are escorted in a military convoy to our distribution point. And we have an entire platoon, basically, who serves as security, just kind of crowd control and everything. It's kind of two armies, one mission. The, the Salvation Army and the U.S. Army have really been great at working side by side and partnering and debriefing and coming up with a good game plan to make our distributions one of the best around in, in Port-au-Prince out of all the ones going on. There's not a lot of uh, rebuilding going on. In fact, there's, there's none yet. People are still trying to clean up from, from, from the rubble. Fortunately, you know, there are no bodies in the street anymore. It's, you know, people have been laid to rest more respectively in the, in the past few weeks. Um, but in some places, definitely life is normal, per se, for the Haitians. Uh, in this marketplace here, you can see people bartering and they trade items. And, you know, they're not, it's, 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 they're not brand new clothes. It's not a designer shop, but it's how they live and, and that's how they're used to living. It's amazing to see that in the midst of all this chaos, there's still life and there's still hope and, you know, and we're going to stay here as long as we need to. The Salvation Army has distributed more than 4 million meals since the earthquake, but as you just saw, more help is needed. You can still donate to relief organizations helping in Haiti. We've put all the information on our website. Just go to kcts9.org slash connects. All right, time now for our weekly roundtable on the news. Joining me now, political strategist Kathy Allen, SeattlePI.com columnist Joel Connolly, political strategist Chris Vance, Seattle Times editorial columnist Joni Balter. And uh, Joel's getting a lot of airtime on our show tonight. All right. Uh, well, let's start with this, health care, talking about that vote happening on uh, Sunday. And we've been seeing a lot of um, ads. Joel, you've written about this this week. Uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, targeting particular uh, House members, uh, specifically in this area, Adam Smith. But also, I think the one vote they're looking for is Brian Baird down in the third district. Uh, what are you hearing? Do you think he's going to go? I think way? Uh, I think Baird will probably ultimately go with the president. Adam Smith has been officially undecided. But remember, he was the first congressman in this state to endorse Barack Obama and was the chairman of the campaign. Why would he want to destroy the presidency that he helped create? But above and beyond this, if you look at the chamber ads and so on, to use the immortal words of Ronald Reagan, you ain't seen nothing yet. Spending about $10 million now, likely to spend uh, $200 million or so. That's and a Supreme maybe, Court ruling. In maybe uh, 10 Senate races and maybe 40 to 45 House races uh, this fall. So if you like the, uh, like the chamber's uh, dire predictions by a soft woman's voice ads now, 
You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> and what gotta, about Ryan Baird? What I'm going to say, you? you know what, I think these guys are both in. I mean, they're playing hard to get. They have in the past, both Adam and Brian have. Obviously, Brian doesn't have anything that's necessarily bothering him now since he's not running for re-election. But the fact is that these guys are both in, and by I think by tomorrow morning, they'll both have that announced. What I do hope about this is if, if health care passes, it looks like it will, that that the folks who s supported it go out and explain what it does because you know what has bothered me the most about this whole debate is the fear of this explain about the donut hole explain when this kicks in and when this mandatory coverage kicks in like, let people understand what it is it's just been mired chris in... um, let me already talk by the republicans about repeal is that going to be the campaign slogan we're going to be hearing all summer long? Oh, I, I think that'll be a big part of it. I think health care will dominate the campaigns just as it's dominated the entire uh, first part of the Obama administration. I think it probably will pass this weekend. And every poll shows that the overwhelming majority of the American people don't want it to pass. Uh, I think the Democrats are in lose-lose situation. If they don't pass health care, they've crippled the Obama presidency. If they do they're going to lose even more seats than they're on schedule to lose right now. Except that 30 million people who get health care that don't have health care are among those who don't usually vote. And if they do get a chance to vote because they now have health care, hmm, might have a few more okay, votes Okay, but let's think. come back to what Joni said here, and that is that explanation of what's in that thing. Uh, then isn't right. it going to behoove the Democrats that's, and the Obama it, administration? It, it, that's, to really that's not necessarily that. behoove the Democrats alone. I spent last weekend in the company of somebody who faces thousands of dollars of drug expenses because she is in the donut hole. People like her have not gotten any reporting or have not had their situations discussed to any degree by the process-obsessed elite Washington, D.C. media, people who are all insured and whose uh, connection with the uh, working poor of this country is if they lived on Mars. But, but that's why I'm saying that if, that if it passes, the, job, the next job is to explain what does it do for each person so that somebody knows that if this version passes $250 this year and then it fills in the donut hole later. Uh, you know, Joni, I would say that if people like you would explain what the donut mm -hmm. hole was as opposed to just assuming the American public knew what the donut hole is. The donut hole is where you get a certain amount of benefits and then there's a certain amount that you don't get and then it kicks back in once you get into really catastrophic care. That's perhaps a job also of the press, Joni. Oh, of course. We, we could have indeed. a debate about whether what the Democrats are going to pass is good legislation or not. But... That's not what's really going to matter in this fall's election, because even if what they're doing is good policy, which I don't believe it is, it will not be, have an effect by November. And what they've done is to convince the middle class, especially middle class white voters, suburban middle class voters who voted for Barack Obama because they thought he was a moderate, that he's not. And that they're really going to pay for this November. We'll right. see. Okay, let's move on to a couple of other things here. Actually, related to this is that Idaho is saying that mm -hmm. they are going to be the first state to uh, file suit uh, against the health care reform law if it passes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Idaho is also that state that's saying to Washington State, why don't you business come over here and come doing business in our backyard because you know what, you guys have too many taxes yeah. over there. Bottom line is that Idaho is a special case and I don't no. think we need to there, go there. There may be as many as 37 states that are going to file suit because the individual individual mandate is probably unconstitutional. Even Rob McKenna has said that. Okay. Uh, Republican. This, this week, Mike McGinn went and spoke uh, before labor, and he got booed. Yeah. Um, well, more well, bad news you. for this guy. He's having a very rough first quarter here. And I would say that if, you know, if you're going to come out and you're going to oppose the tunnel, the building of the tunnel, or if you're going to oppose building the current plan for 520, you better believe people who thought they were going to get jobs are not going to be happy with you. And then Dow Constantine, the King County executive, gets up, and he's a let's go forward kind of guy, and you'd think he was, you know, uh, the swami or something. But, but McGinn may actually manage to uh, alienate everybody, not only the city workers, not only the union people, but he has now kind of given an imprimatur to the... Uh, uh, Chihuly Museum, um, while many of the city's open space people and, and conservationists would like uh, would like more green than glass at the at the Seattle Center. So he may end up with great cities and may even end up with the Sierra Club on opposite sides of him in this one. All right, I can't help this, but uh, the Huskies, I'm glad to see that they won <laughs> yesterday, and uh, they're going to be playing New Mexico. But you probably saw this. Uh, 
their graduation rate is only 29% on the basketball team. And Artie Duncan, the Secretary of Education, says that no team should be getting into the tournament if they don't have at least a 40% yeah. graduation well, rate. Let me say two things about this. First of all, <laughs> the same, when the same report came out against, about the UW football team, it had one of the highest graduation rates in the nation. Um, I'm not sure about this, Enrique, but uh, Coach Romar's had a bunch of kids leave his program early to transfer to other schools or go to the NBA. That might be what's affecting the graduation rate because the UW has a very good record in the other sports on graduation rates. And let me just point out that the women's basketball team yeah. Doesn't have that problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but also, but they're not. I think in this case that, that if you if you uh, drilled down on this, you might discover that it was it was going to the NBA. Yeah. That okay. that might just be the. Answer. But I think we'll all agree that we hope that Washington, even me as a Cougar, I will root for them uh, yeah. as they play. Well, dogs we're, we're, we're against, rooting for dogs. Eastern there you go. Washington <laughs> and Western. Hey, Washington. And also, before we go here, let's say. Uh, that uh, he's in our thoughts, and that is Sam Reed, Secretary oh, of God. State, going in for kidney can is a cancerous kidney. Saw him today. He's doing pretty well, so let's hope that he does well through uh, that surgery on Amen. Monday. Amen. All right, thank you all. You got thank it. You. Before we close tonight, we want to note the passing this week of Ernest Aguilar, an important figure in Washington State's Latino community. Last year, the State House honored Aguilar for his tireless public service and legacy of accomplishments on behalf of the Latino community. Ernie Aguilar was a trailblazer and a mentor. He was the first Latino in the state to seek a county office. He was the founder and chairman emeritus of the Washington State Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. He was a charter member of the State Commission on Hispanic Affairs. He inspired the first endowed Latino scholarship at the University of Washington Business School. And he helped countless Latinos, including me, seek careers and professions where few of us had ever been before. Ernie passed away on Monday, surrounded by his family. He was laid to rest today on what would have been his 91st birthday. And that's all for this edition of KCTS 9 Connects. I'm Enrique Cerna. We'll see you next time. Local production and broadcast of KCTS 9 Connects with Enrique Cerna is made possible in part by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by KCTS 9 members. Become a member today by going to kcts9.org. Thank you.